welcome to Kairos Research Centre podcast. Christian faith seeking understanding, intellectual witness and spiritual renewal. Welcome to Kairos new podcast series. Is Ecclesiastes and the Human Quest for Meaning. Ecclesiastes. This is a tongue twister word. And also a puzzling book with striking and memorable phrases. Vanity of vanities. Much study is a weariness to the flesh. The book highlights the unpredictability of life. Just to take from chapter 9, verse 11. I have observed something under the sun. The wise go sometimes go hungry, and the skillful are not necessarily wealthy, and those who are educated don't always live successful lives, sound familiar. It's all decided by chance by being in the right place and at the right time. This is vanity of vanities indeed. And yet the book affirms something about life. We know the phrase, a time to love, a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. And then, verse 4, But whoever is among the living has hope. A live dog is better than a dead lion. Verse 7, Go, eat your bread with joy, and drink your wine with a merry heart. Live joyfully with the wife. Sounds ironic, confusing. Not surprisingly, many modern readers simply dismiss Ecclesiastes. It's just another ancient book. What has it got to say to the human quest for meaning today with modern technology and conveniences? Thankfully, today we have with us Dr. Leong Tian Fook to help shed some light to clear our confusion. Dr. Leon is, uh, is familiar to us. He has a degree in civil engineering from University of Malaya, an MA in Old Testament studies from Wheaton College Graduate School, and a PhD in ancient or Near Eastern languages and cultures from the University of California, Los Angeles. He reads Hebrew, uh, ancient Babylonian, and Arcadian, you know, better than Indiana Jones. He is eminently qualified to share with us insights from the ancient book of Ecclesiastes to the problem of meaning in life. Actually, he has written a good book on Ecclesiastes uh, after having meditated on it for a long time and after decades of life experience. Here's the book. Our reason for being an exposition on Ecclesiastes and of the meaning on the meaning of life. So this book is available is published in the US Beef and Stock, but it's, thankfully it's available in the local bookshop. Uh, you can get the book from Canaan Land, Evangel, and Glad Sound. So he who hesitates is lost because the stock will be finished. But of course, today we are here to seek wisdom. And to get wisdom, you must ask a wise scholar. So I begin with the obvious question. Dr. Leong, as I mentioned, Ecclesiastes is an ancient book which people find difficult to understand. We've got many easier modern self-help books already. Why bother to pay attention to the book of Ecclesiastes? Well, the very first course I taught in seminary was on Ecclesiastes. When a colleague heard about it, this was what he shared with me. He said a non-Christian man had been following his Christian wife to a weekly home Bible fellowship. During the Bible study, he would not say a word. But when they first started studying Ecclesiastes, he suddenly exclaimed, Now, this makes sense. This means all the Bible studies he had been attending did not make sense to him. Most likely, they were using the NIV Bible. According to the NIV translation, Ecclesiastes says, Everything is meaningless. This finally made sense to him. The modern world is characterized by two related things. Godlessness and meaninglessness. When I was a teenager, I used to say, God is a concept created to explain reality rather than a reality in itself. This means God does not even exist let alone created human beings. In fact, human beings created God to try and make sense of reality. At the same time, a close friend kept saying, life has no meaning. I myself felt a deep sense of meaninglessness. Ecclesiastes addresses the question of the meaning of life in a way most satisfying to the human heart. Thus, it speaks powerfully to not only Christians, but also non-Christians and point them to God and then to Christ. Ecclesiastes speaks to non-Christians where they are at to help them make sense of God and of the Gospel. So Ecclesiastes is needed today more than ever. 
Okay, let's speak on the idea of meaninglessness. So it's depressing enough to go look around and see if you can find a way out of this messy, meaningless world. Okay, let's go to Ecclesiastes as you suggest. But when I read it straight away, when I read the NIV version, this phrase jumps at me. Everything is meaningless. This is quite shocking, you know. I thought the Bible would offer a more encouraging view. And then it says, everything is meaningless. How can such a pessimistic view of life be taught in the Bible? Yes, the NIV translation renders the theme of Ecclesiastes as everything is meaningless. This, transla this translation does present a pessimistic view of life. However, there have been attempts to limit this pessimistic view of life to people who do not believe in God. This is how it is done. The phrase, under the sun, occurs frequently in Ecclesiastes and nowhere else in the Bible. It qualifies what Ecclesiastes says about life. If Ecclesiastes is saying everything is meaningless, this applies only to people under the sun. What then does under the sun mean? The most popular evangelical interpretation is that under the sun means something like this. When you view and live your life without God. This means Ecclesiastes is saying that life has no meaning only when you leave God out of your life. This is a very preachable message. Thus, this interpretation is popular among Christian preachers who preach from Ecclesiastes. But the question is this, does under the sun really mean when you leave God out of your life? In the ancient biblical world, this phrase refers to this world as opposed to the nether world. To be under the sun is to see the sun, that is, to be alive in this world. If you are not under the sun, either you are already you are not yet born or you are already dead, regardless of whether you believe in God or not. In Ecclesiastes, under the sun clearly also has this meaning. For example, in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 3, one who is not yet born is one who has not seen the evil that is done under the sun. That is, the unborn are those who are not yet under the sun. In chapter 4, 15, the living are those who walk under the sun. And in 9, 6, the dead are those who no longer have a share in all that is done under the sun. That means the dead are those who are no longer under the sun. So in Ecclesiastes, under the sun clearly means this life as opposed to the nether world. Since under the sun qualifies everything is meaningless, it means in this world everything is meaningless, regardless of whether you believe in God or not. This is certainly a pessimistic view of life. Can the inspired word of God be teaching such an unorthodox view of life? The question then is this. Is everything is meaningless the correct rendering of the theme of Ecclesiastes? There are more than 30 English translations of the Bible. Only the NIV and the NLT, the New Living Translation, render the theme of Ecclesiastes as everything is meaningless. Most Bible translations retain the traditional rendering, which is all is vanity. All is vanity means everything is profitless. But this is not pessimistic. We need to understand all is vanity in its context as well as in the context of Ecclesiastes as a whole. When we, will, when we do that, we will see that everything is profitless is not pessimistic. It just means this. We all have to die. When we die, we have to leave behind everything we have gained in this world. They will eventually become profitless to us. In other words, under the sun, that is, in this temporal world, all the things we have gained is ultimately profitless. These temporal things, like money or even academic degrees, do have immediate profits. Otherwise, we will not work at all to get them. But they have no ultimate profit because we cannot take them with us when we die. Therefore, all is vanity, regardless of whether you believe in God or not. This is not pessimistic, but simply realistic. Uh, you mentioned the need to understand all is vanity, not only in the context of the passage, but when the phrase appears in the context of the book as a whole. Of course, when you talk about the book as a whole, you're assuming that Ecclesiastes is a coherent book. But that's the problem. It appears to me the majority of biblical scholars in the Western world, uh, academia, assume the book is full of contradictions. How can it be a coherent book? Well, whether we see coherence or contradictions in the book 
depends on how we read the book. For now, I will just highlight that all the supposed contradictions in the book are only apparent, not real, just as the supposed pessimism is only apparent. Ecclesiastes is wisdom literature. We need to recognize the nature of wisdom literature. Wisdom is about putting knowledge of truth into practice. When we apply the same truth in different contexts, we may even apply it in opposite directions. The best example is found in Proverbs 26, verses 4 and 5. It says, Do not answer a fool according to his folly, lest you also be like him yourself. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he will be wise in his own eyes. So do we answer a fool or not? The contradiction is only apparent. The truth about the fool is the same in both cases. According to the book of Proverbs, the fool is one who says there is no God, at least in his heart, and thus lives as though there is no God. Proverbs 14.1 Also, he is right in his own eyes, and he brings harm to himself and to others. In one context, because the fool is right in his own eyes, there is no point responding to him. In fact, one Proverbs says, the fool has no delight in understanding, but only in expressing his own opinion. It would then be foolish to answer him because, as another proverb says, he will despise the wisdom of your words. Thus, we have become a fool like him. But in another context, because the fool brings harm not only to himself, but also to others, we need to respond and show him and others that he is foolish. Proverbs 18.17 says, the one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and cross-examines him. So if a fool is not cross-examined as in the court of law, what he says seems right and leads others astray. A good example of a context where we should answer the fool is in a debate with an atheist. The goal is not to convince him, but those who listen to the debate. This is to limit his influence on others, and so limit the harm he would bring them. Hence, we see that we need to evaluate every application of truth in its own context and make sense of it in that context. When we bear this in mind, we will see that there is no contradiction in Ecclesiastes. We will look at just one example. Ecclesiastes 6, 3 says, A stillborn child is better off than a rich man who cannot enjoy his wealth. Now, a stillborn child has never seen the sun. This is because he has never been alive in this world. If he is better off than the rich man, it means it is better off for the rich man not to have been born. It is not good for him to see the sun. However, Ecclesiastes 11.7 says, It is good for the eyes to see the sun. A superficial reading will see contradiction in the two texts. But if we bear in mind how the truth is applied in the respective context, we will see no contradiction. The truth is this, because all is vanity, to make sense of life, we need to enjoy what we have. This teaching is a sub theme of Ecclesiastes that begins in chapter 2, verses 24 to 26. Now, Ecclesiastes 6, 2 says, the rich man cannot enjoy what he has, even though he has so much that his soul lacks nothing that he desires. This is because 6.3 itself says, he is not satisfied with good things. In 6.9, people like him are warned. What the eyes see is better than what the soul desires. What does this warning mean? This is how the Good News Bible paraphrases it. It is better to be satisfied with what you have than to be always wanting something else. This means the rich man is not satisfied with his wealth because he is covetous always wanting something else. A covetous heart cannot be satisfied. The NLT paraphrases 6.9 this way, Enjoy what you have rather than desiring what you don't have. This means when you are covetous and keep desiring what you don't have, you cannot enjoy what you have, you have no matter how much you already have. For how can we enjoy what we have when we are not satisfied with it and keep desiring something else? Since we all have to die and leave behind everything that we have gained, it makes no sense to keep desiring what we don't have and as a result, cannot enjoy what we already have. So the rich man's life is meaningless 
such a life is not worth living. Thus, in this context, it is better off for him not to have been born. It is not good for him to see the sun. Hence, in the context of Ecclesiastes 6.3, it is about a life that is not worth living. However, in the context of Ecclesiastes 11.7, it is about a young, how a young man can enjoy, have enjoyment of life in the days of his youth. And this is to avoid emotional and physical pain. 11.9 This means to avoid covetousness as it brings emotional and physical pain. Thus, in contrast to the case of the rich man in 6.3, 11.7 is about a life that is worth living. In this context, it is good to be alive. It is good to see the sun. So in one context, it is good to see the sun. In the other, it is not good. Again, we see that the same truth can have opposite applications in different contexts. Therefore, there is no contradiction. All the other supposed contradictions can be similarly resolved.